Okay, we're going to talk about the three methods of charging an object. So we've talked about charge, and <clears throat> charge is measured in coulombs. And to get charge to move to different objects, we have to have a conductor. And the charge that is actually moving are the electrons, because they're farther away from the nucleus, they're more free to move around. And so how do we actually get an object to be charged? So there are three methods. So the first method is charging by friction. So we're going to rub two objects together, and when one, of, when one of our object wants the electrons more. So a good example is if you take a balloon, you rub it in your hair, your balloon becomes clingy to other things. So it's gained extra electrons, and your hair has lost those electrons, becomes positive. So how do we know which two substances would make good objects to charge it by friction? So we use something called a triboelectric series, which is pictured here. And we just want to choose different things from opposite ends of our series. So for example, like human hair versus like a silicon or a polystyrene, um, like what a balloon is made out of. So they're on opposite ends. So your hair wants to become positive and lose those electrons. The balloon likes to gain those extra electrons. So a good example is if we use our drawn to voltage here we can charge an object by friction. So the most common example is walking on the carpet, you're picking up those extra electrons. So the carpet wants to give them away, you want to gain those. So as you walk across the carpet, you can gain some extra electrons here. And then if you touch something, Ouch. those electrons get released. So charging by friction. Objects are rubbed against one another, one of them is going to gain those electrons, and one of them is going to lose them. Ouch. So that's charging by friction. The second method is charging by conduction. So charging by conduction, you're just going to take an object that's already charged, and you're going to touch it in contact with an object that is not charged. So here, if you look at the picture, we have um, a piece of metal or an object here that's charged with extra electrons. We touch it to the dome and both the dome and our object stay charged or become charged. So charging by conduction is just touching an object that's already charged to a neutral object. A lot of times that object may lose all of its charge and the other object may gain all of it. So the same thing happens with our John Travolta chair. As we charge by friction, we gain extra electrons. We touch the doorknob, and we charge the doorknob by conduction. <laughs> okay, so charging by friction, you rub two objects together, you touch a metal object, Ouch. you charge it by conduction. So first method, charging by friction, second method, charging by conduction. The last method is charging by induction. So it's a little bit kind of like the opposite of charging by conduction. So here we're not actually touching the objects together. So we bring a charged object close to another object, and it causes the charges to separate. But our object, like this tin can here, doesn't actually lose or gain any electrons. It's still neutral. But what it does is if you bring a positive wand next to it, it kind of pulls the electrons to the surface. If you bring a negative object to it, it kind of pushes the electrons away from the surface. But if you notice, the, the tin can still is neutral. All that we've done is separated the charges. We call it charge separation. So an example of that is if we take this balloon, we charge it by friction, so we rub it on the shirt here, and if we bring it close to the wall, watch what happens to the wall, the charges. So we're not actually touching the surface, okay? But it's pushing those electrons away from the surface because they're repelling. So this is charging by induction. And sometimes you can get the, if you've ever done this at home, you can get the balloon to stick to the wall. The wall is not actually gaining or losing electrons. You're just causing the electrons to separate in the, in the wall. So charging by induction. So the last thing we have to talk about then is how do we quantify the force? So we've talked about like charges repel, opposite charges retract. 
but how much is that force felt on those objects? So we can quantify that force by using Coulomb's law. So Coulomb is what we measure charge in, but his law is written down here in the corner. So K is Coulomb's constant. It's always equal to 9 times 10 to the negative 9. Q1 is the charge on object 1. Q2 is the charge on object 2. And R is standing for not the radius, but the distance between the two charges squared. And then we have it in absolute value. So constant times charge 1 times charge 2 divided by the distance squared. So we want to make sure force is measured in newtons. We want our charge measured in coulombs. The distance should be in meters. And coulombs constant is a bunch of units there so that it cancels out so we get newtons. So you can kind of see here, as we increase the distance between two charges, we see the force decrease. So as the charges move farther apart from one another, the force felt on them is going to be less. Makes sense. We can also see that as we change the amount of charge, so as we increase the, the strength of those charges, the force should increase. So if we have a plus two charge compared to a plus one, the plus two charge is going to have a stronger force. The last thing on this screen is just a reminder that a lot of times a coulomb is a big unit. So sometimes you're given your units in millicoulombs or microcoulombs or nanocoulombs. But it's a simple to convert back to coulombs. We just tack on the times 10 to the negative third if we're talking about millicoulombs, times 10 to the negative six, or times 10 to the negative ninth. So if, for example, if we had 35 microcoulombs, how would we get that to coulombs? All we have to do is add on times 10 to the negative six. So 35 microcoulombs is equal to 35 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. So let's try an example using Coulomb's law. So here we have two charges. They're separated by a distance of 0.5. One charge has a value of 1.2 microcoulombs, and the other charge has a value of plus 3 millicoulombs. So let's figure out what the force would be. So we're going to use Coulomb's law, which is our force, F, absolute value, our constant K, which is 9 times 10 to the 9th, times our first charge. Now we have to convert micro to coulombs. So our micro is times 10 to the negative 6. We're just going to add that on. And our charge 2 is our 3 millicoulombs. So milli is time ten, times 10 to the negative third. And that's all divided by the distance between them squared. So we're going to divide it by 0.5 squared. Plug it all into your calculator. Just remember to keep brackets around your uh, numbers with times 10 or use the E button on your calculator. So 9e to the 9th times negative 1.2e to the negative 6 times 3e to the negative 3rd. And I'm going to divide that all by 0.5 I get a force between those two charges of 129.6 newtons. Remember, it's absolute value, so if our, we get a negative answer, we make it positive. Okay, let's try another example from Coulomb's Law. So we have a 20 microcoulomb point charge, and it's located 20 centimeters away from a 40 microcoulomb point charge. What is the force on each due to the other? So to calculate our force, we're going to use Coulomb's law. So our constant, 9 times 10 to the 9th, times 10 
times charge one. So we have to convert micro to normal coulombs. So we're going to take 20 and micro is times 10. So it's negative 6. Times by the next charge. So negative 40 times 10 to the negative 6 as well to convert it. All divided by the distance between them squared. So 20 centimeters. So we can't use centimeters. We have to be in meters. So remember, divide by 100, move it over to, to the left, will give us centimeters, so 0 0.20 squared. And again, we have our absolute value brackets in there. So our answer, so 9e to the 9th times 20e to the negative 6 times negative 40e to the negative 6, all divided by 0.2 squared. We get a force of 180 newtons. Remember, absolute value, so if it's negative, we make it positive. So if we think about this example, we have a plus 20 and a negative 40. Would this be attractive or repulsive? And opposites attract, so it would be attractive force. So you have a couple more of these to try on your homework for today. So let's review our understanding of charge. So compared to insulators, metals are better conductors of electricity because metals contain more free what? So is it A, positive ions, B, negative ions, C, protons, or D, electrons? So the answer should be D, electrons. So metals are better conductors because they have more free electrons. Number two, electrons in an insulator are A, bound to their atoms but may move freely throughout the solid, B, not bound to their atoms and may move freely throughout the solid, C, bound to their atoms and may not move freely at all within a solid, or D, bound to their atoms but may move short distances within their solid. So the answer should be D. The electrons in an insulator are bound to their atoms but may move short distances within their solid. Next question. A positively charged sphere is touched with a ground wire. What is the charge on the sphere after the ground wire is removed? Is it A, positive, B, neutral, or C, negative? answer should be B, neutral. So whenever you connect something to the ground, which is our large neutral object, it's going to make the same object that it's touching neutral as well. So if our object was positively charged, electron from the ground are going to come up into that sphere, making it neutral. And our last question, if a positively charged rod touches a neutral conducting sphere and is removed, what charge remains on the sphere? And what happens to the magnitude of the charge on the rod? Is it A, the sphere becomes positive and the rod's net charge stays the same? B, the sphere becomes positive and the rod's net charge decreases? Is it C, the sphere becomes negative and the rod's net charge stays the same? Or D, the sphere remains neutral and the rod's net charge stays the same? So for this example, the answer should be B. The sphere becomes positive and the rod's net charge decreases. So some of the electrons from the sphere, which is neutral, are going to move to the rod. So because the sphere lost electrons, it's going to be positive and the rod's gained some electrons, so its net charge should decrease. <laughs>